My book is divided into four sections. The first describes the last weeks of Noah's life and his death, and I put it first because I think people are curious about death generally, and more specifically, curious about the death of a child. So the second section uh, contains stories about Noah's life, their life stories. And in this, you'll learn um, why the book is also a love story. The narrative then returns to the time just after Noah's death, and it ends with essays uh, about life without our son. I'll be reading something from each of these sections. What I'm going to read first is from the middle of the first section, a chapter titled Homeward Bound. No, it doesn't. I take that back. It's home. It's, it's, it's home, but it's home stretch. Not home bound. Home bound at the end. So, okay, so this is home stretch. Um, and I'm glad you all laughed now. Um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, now, um, when this story picks up, Noah has been in the hospital about two weeks, okay? Um, I have no memory of putting pen to paper, but I know we signed. I don't recall making my careless cloud-like signature. Which one of us signed first? I may have pushed the do not resuscitate papers toward Mike. It was what we both wanted for Noah. No, wanted isn't the right word. We didn't want Noah to die. We wanted him to live. We wanted him to come home from the hospital, recover from his lung infection, and for our lives to return to what they were before he got sick. But what we wanted, and the certainty of his prognosis, weren't the same thing. The signing of the orders had to be done, so nothing would be done. This is where nurses meet, I thought, as we were led into a plain room. One wall was covered by an oversized bulletin board tacked with personal notes, wage and hour regulations, and a potluck announcement. Mike and I sat on the long side of the laminated table, our pediatric physician, chaplain, and a social worker on the other side of us. Bete between us were a dull, faded flower arrangement in a few Martha Stewart magazines with the labels cut off. We talked through dozens of scenarios before this meeting, weighing our options and questioning our decisions. What seemed like the right decision direction one hour would be wrong the next. Separate members of Noah's clinical team talked with us about the orders during his hospitalization. Signing would make it official. The act of signing forced us to ask questions of ourselves and the team about what was best for Noah and if there was any purpose in futile measures. If nothing is going to make him better or cure him, then why are we prolonging things, I asked. Keeping Noah alive just to revive him doesn't make sense. I don't think the tubes and the oxygen and suctioning are good for him, said Mike with a shaky voice. It causes Noah too much pain. I hate seeing him in pain. He stared out the window for a long bit. He's suffering, and I feel like we're just keeping him alive to let him die. That's not right, I said, looking directly at the chaplain. I knew she was on our side. We understand, the doctor responded. I sighed and squeezed Mike's hand. Perhaps our wishes wouldn't be met with resistance or harsh questioning. I didn't know what to expect, and I wondered if there would be someone on staff who might be brought in to, to test our judgment and rationale. I bit my lip. If Noah couldn't live the life of a normal 17-year-old, would his life be worth living? And Noah's normal was already complicated. Because of his cerebral palsy, he used a wheelchair. He needed ankle foot orthotics. He wore arm splints, and he had periodic Botox, Botox injections in his hands to loosen them up. He needed help with everything, from schoolwork to getting dressed to taking showers. His daily care was a large part of our life as a family, and it was all any of us ever knew. We cared for him now in the same way we did when he was 3, 10, or 12 years old. The social worker began to speak. Mike and Roberta are the parents of Noah, who has been in the PICU for three days. His prognosis is, what did she say? I don't remember. That his prognosis was grim, or grave, or fatal. I realize now that she didn't finish the sentence because I had buried my face in Mike's shoulder. The last thing I wanted to hear was the truth. Had I failed my son? I felt as if I had. All my good mothering wasn't going to keep my son alive. My head pounded. The team waited. When I lifted my head, she continued. Noah's parents have opted to sign allow natural death orders and do not resuscitate orders for their son. We want to make sure that they understand what we do in these situations, she said. 
The doctor explained the details. We understood. The orders would stop them from inserting a ventilator into Noah's lungs if he couldn't breathe on his own, and it would avoid chest compressions if his heart stopped. Allow natural death orders would pr provide palliative <coughs> care only, so our son would die comfortably. As much as we didn't want him to die, we wanted that. Were we playing God? Hell no. If I played God, I would have saved my son's life. But there was no saving Noah. He was too ill. His lungs were too badly infected and scarred. He was too weak to cough, which was the one thing that he could have done to help. We could have put him on a ventilator every time he stopped breathing, but to what end? We were told that when the vent came out, it wouldn't be for long. Many parents take extreme measures to keep their children alive, but sometimes doing everything to save your child is too much. Was it a selfish decision to allow him to die, or was it compassionate and loving? We didn't want Noah to live breathlessly and in pain and fear. His green eyes showed terror as he gasped for air, and his face was taught and his whole body tensed from the effort. It was painful for everyone. We knew already that if he became well enough to be released from the hospital, that he'd be too fragile to leave the house, ever. How could we force our outgoing son to live in the confines of our home? All the things we did as a family, both ordinary and fun, would be prohibited. His life would re be reduced to that of a sickly, bedridden child. That scared us as much as the thought of him dying. We signed the orders with the quality of Noah's life in mind, and our own as well. As parents and caregivers, his ongoing illness had become our illness too, but we didn't want illness to be all that he had. <laughs>